God could never forgive me. I've done some awful things. How many times has that thought passed through the minds of humans since sin entered the world back in the Garden of Eden? Maybe this statement that I just read is one that you're familiar with. Does this thought or one similar to it frequently linger in your mind? When you are alone at night with just your thoughts, maybe you're sitting in your living room or laying on your bed, are your thoughts thoughts of despair, hopelessness, and frustration? I hope not. I hope that's not the case. Brethren, do you doubt whether God has forgiven you or whether He can forgive you? In a few moments, we will consider the private thoughts of a prodigal boy in a pig pen in the far country to see what hope can be gleaned from his story. The teachings in the Bible on the topic of forgiveness, they are very simple to understand, yet they are not always easy for mankind to accept. Sadly, many lost souls in the past have never become Christians because they thought or they bought into the lie that they were too wicked for God to forgive. And in 2024, sadly, many souls are also buying into that same lie that they are just too wicked for God to forgive. Sometimes Christians who have sinned against God and have done what He has said to have those sins forgiven have had and still do have uh, trouble accepting that God has forgiven them. And this has caused them to carry a heavy load of unnecessary guilt. Here's another sad reality. Sometimes people, and sometimes even Christians, do not want to extend forgiveness to those whom God has commanded them to extend it to. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, Jesus said, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. You know what Jesus said in those verses, that's not hard uh, to understand. He, he didn't say something very difficult to understand there. But sadly, for some people, that is a hard teaching for them to accept. The question of this lesson, which is, can God really forgive me, is one that many individuals who are lost and have never become true Christians struggle with. And it is also uh, one that Christians uh, struggle with, uh, yet they're unassured um, or they've become Christians, and yet they're unassured of God's capability to forgive them. If I were to ask all of you the question, can God really forgive me? It is my hope that all of you, everyone in here, would confidently answer yes. God can forgive me. God can forgive anyone. Um, but there's a, there's a uh, caveat to that, or there's a, uh, a clarification that needs to be made to that. And so as we study this lesson tonight and as we go through some of the points in Brother Webster's uh, tract, we're going to see that God is abundant in mercy and that He is willing to forgive any sin a person commits so long as they do what He says to have those sins forgiven. And so that's the clarification. It's not just unconditional forgiveness, but God will forgive those who want to truly be forgiven. And so, as I said uh, a, moment, a few moments ago, many of the thoughts and points that I've included in this lesson, they came from this tract that Re uh, Brother Webster wrote. And I hope that this lesson and some of the things that Brother Webster put in his tract, I hope that they will challenge us to think about our souls. I hope that this lesson will uh, challenge us and, and cause us to uh, think about where we stand with God spiritually and how well we trust in God's Word. Also, I hope this lesson will edify and encourage you and give you confidence that God can and that He will forgive you no matter what you've done and no matter how far you've drifted away from Him if you choose to come back to Him and fully submit to His will. In this lesson, what we will do for the bulk of it is we will consider various people in the Bible who were wrapped up in sin and we will consider the mercy and forgiveness that God extended to them. And we will do this partially because of this reason. If God could forgive all of these individuals who we read of in the Bible that we're going to consider, then He can certainly forgive any one of us too. And I think that's a very important point. God's done it before. He's forgiven mankind many times. And we, re we read of that all throughout the Bible. If He can do that with them, He can do that with us today. Let us now uh, move into considering 
the famous boy we know as the prodigal son or the lost son. And Jesus' famous uh, parable of the lost or prodigal son, it's found recorded in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. And this boy, the prodigal son or lost son, he was an invention of the master storyteller to convey a message about forgiveness, a message about a father's all-encompassing, incomprehensible love. And of course, that's talking about God the Father. This parable, it offers a hope-filled message for those who are penitent. And while he was off in the far country, away from his father, as you read the parable, you uh, learn and understand that this hungry prodigal son knew, as he thought back to his father and his household, he knew that his father would not go to bed with, a hungry, uh, with hunger in his stomach or a growling stomach. However, as you read the parable, this prodigal son would. He would be starving. He would be hungering. He even, uh, even his father's servants back on his father's property had bread enough and to spare, as Luke 15, 17 records. But you see, he did not have bread enough and to spare. He, didn't, he chose a bad path to go down, and he didn't even have uh, the food, the physical necessities that he needed and that he wanted. Luke 15, 17 uh, says, But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. Since the father in this parable represents the father in the Bible, we can draw some interesting conclusions from the phrase we find within that verse I just read of bread enough and to spare. See, a truth that we find throughout the Bible is that throughout the Scriptures we find that God has never been stingy with His blessings. As James chapter 1, verse 5 records, God gives to all liberally and without reproach. And later on in that same chapter, in James chapter 1, verse 17, James said, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. And so, with the blessings of God on our minds, and how He is not stingy with those blessings, let us consider various Bible passages wherein we can read of the blessings uh, that God has given mankind in the form of food and drink. When uh, the children of Israel needed food in the wilderness, God was there and God blessed them with the manna. And, uh, and regarding the manna, Exodus chapter 16, verse 16, it says, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Let every man gather it according to each one's need. Uh, one omer for each person, according to the number of persons. Let every man take for those who are in his tent. So God provided the manna. Another good Old Testament account is when we read of a widow who shared with Elijah what she thought was her last meal. And God, as you read that account, God refilled her meal barrel, and no matter how much she dipped out of that meal barrel, it stayed full until the famine ended. In 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 15 and 16, it records, So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. When Jesus in the New Testament fed 5,000 men plus women and children, the famished people ate, were filled, and what did they have? They had leftovers. There was still 12 baskets left over afterwards, Matthew 14, 20. When we think of mankind and we see the magnitude of mankind's sin, at times it can be hard to understand how a single sinner could be saved. But on the other hand, when we look to the Scriptures and we read about the character of God and we see the magnitude of His love, we can clearly see that God desires mankind to be saved and that He is sufficient in saving those who obey His will. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, Paul said, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Jesus even carried this mindset of wanting mankind to be forgiven of their sins with Him, even while He was on the cross. 
The beginning of Luke 23, verse 34 says, Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Brethren, it may be the case that someone in this church building this evening, listening to this lesson, has wandered away from God. Perhaps someone here has left the father's side and, like the prodigal son, has gone into the far country spiritually. As we listen to this lesson and after we depart from this building, let us all honestly examine ourselves to consider where we are at spiritually. If you have left God and you are caught up in sin, I want you to consider this question. This is a good question. What can a lost individual count on when they make the humble journey back to God the Father from the far country of misery and sin? What can they expect, what can they count on if they make that, make that good choice? Brethren, the answer is that there is grace enough and to spare with God. Psalm chapter 84, verse 11 says, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will He withhold from those who walk uprightly. If you have wandered away from God and you choose to come back to Him and submit to His will, He will forgive you and you will be blessed. But... It may be the case that you doubt whether this is true. Have you been listening to the lie that you have done too many bad things for God to forgive you? If this is the case, I want you to honestly consider the following questions and thoughts. Is your case too difficult for God? Have your sins been so shocking and frequent that God simply could not or that He would not forgive you? I want you to consider that He who made the universe and the earth Think about all that power. Think about how God created this universe and earth. Think about His power, has, how God has no bound to His strength, no, no, uh, nor no limit to His might. Think about the nature of our God, how powerful He is. God has never failed at anything. We, we read that throughout the Bible. God's never failed at anything, and I think this is a good question. What makes you think His first failure will be saving you? He won't fail in saving you. If He said He will, He will, if you follow His will. Do you really think that you'll prove too wicked for our omnipotent God? Do you think your case will boggle the omniscient mind of our God? Do you really think that you are too evil or so evil or unlovable for our omnibenevolent God to forgive you? If so, if you've uh, started believing those lies, if, if you've done that, what is, the reality of the matter is that you have been tricked by the devil and you must stop listening to him. Satan is a liar and he wants you to believe these lies. Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 27 is a great verse and it says, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? The answer is no, there's nothing too hard for God. If God made you, Genesis 1, 26 and 27, then the Bible in first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says that God can remake you and He can make you into what you need to be. Isaiah 59, verse 1 records that the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save. In 2024, is there still bread enough on God's table of grace for mankind? The answer is yes. And I love this verse, Isaiah 55, verse 7. But uh, many centuries ago, Isaiah issued this uh, invitation many centuries ago in Isaiah 55, verse 7. He said, Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. And brethren, that verse, though it, was, uh, though it was written down many centuries ago, the offer of it still stands today. God will abundantly pardon those who come back to Him and uh, faithfully follow Him. God offers grace that is exceedingly abundant. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 14. Uh, God offers abundant mercy. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25 reveals that God is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through Him. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 11, Peter said, For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 5, verse 20, Paul concluded that where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. 
I want to get to the root of the problem for those who are in doubt of God's willingness or ability to forgive the sins of mankind, including Christians who have strayed from the faith. What is the root of this problem of doubting God's ability uh, or willingness to forgive? Well, when someone holds these doubts within their mind, it reveals that the person in doubt of God's willingness and or ability to forgive them, it reveals that they have a faith problem. And this faith problem must be resolved or fixed. The Bible reveals that we must have true faith in God to please Him. Hebrews 11.6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please Him, for he who comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. And so when a person doubts whether God can really forgive them, they are guilty of doubting some of the aspects of God's perfectly divine nature. First off, one aspect of God's divine nature that we've referenced many times here in lessons and, and we, we, all, uh, we all probably know is that God cannot lie. The Bible says part of God's nature is that He cannot lie. Titus chapter 1, verse 2. The Bible, which is God's inspired word, is the truth. It is the ultimate standard of truth. And so whatever God has revealed in His Word, it is the truth and it cannot be wrong. And so, since God has promised that He will forgive those who repent of their sins and those who will submit to His will, to doubt whether He can is to doubt the teachings of the Bible, which is the inspired words of God, who once again cannot lie. It's to say that God could lie or that God did lie if you doubt His ability. Second, another aspect of God's divine nature is that He is completely impartial in his uh, treatment of mankind. Acts chapter 10, verse 34 and 35 says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. And so, as I said a little earlier, if God only for offered uh, forgiveness to some individuals, but not to others, he would be partial. If God only extended the offer of forgiveness to evil individuals that we read of in the Bible, but not to wicked people in our time today, including us at one time, then God would be partial to forgive some and not forgive others. I also believe that many people struggle with holding an unbalanced view of God, which may be a partial cause of individuals struggling with doubt. While some passages in our Bibles reveal how terrifying it is when He punishes sin, when God punishes sin, we must keep those passages balanced with the verses that teach about His incredible mercy and love for us. The same God who is described as a consuming fire in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29, is also described as being ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon Him. Psalm 86, verse 5. If I were to change the question of this lesson, which is, can God really forgive me, to this question, will God really forgive me? Those are two different questions. Can God really forgive me is a question of God's ability to forgive mankind. The scriptures are clear that God is able to forgive mankind. He has the ability to save every human being. However, the question of, will God really forgive me, is another story. What God will do and what God can do or is able to do are two different things. God is able to save and forgive all of mankind. But the Bible tells us that God will not save and forgive all of mankind. And why is that the case? This is because God's salvation and forgiveness are conditional. In, order, in other words, mankind must meet certain conditions found within the Bible to obtain salvation and to obtain forgiveness of their sins. And then, sadly, the majority of this world has not met God's conditions to be forgiven. The Bible teaches that God will not forgive those who will not repent of their sins. God will not forgive those who refuse to obey His will. And yet we have many people in our world today who are doing those things. Luke 17, 3 and 4, it reveals that even the forgiveness we, as Christians, extend to our brethren is conditional, or at least it's supposed to be conditional. 
In those verses, Luke 17, 3 and 4, Jesus said, Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you, saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. So the forgiveness that we are to extend to our brethren is to be conditioned upon their repentance. We shouldn't forgive our brethren if they don't repent and ask for forgiveness from us. God doesn't forgive those who don't repent and ask for His forgiveness. And so why should we uh, forgive those who won't repent and seek forgiveness from us the proper way? And so uh, because our, our uh, forgiveness that we extend to our brethren is uh, conditioned upon their repentance, uh, or because of that fact, or we see that fact in the Bible, we also see that that is true with God. The same is true with God, that we, in order to be forgiven, must repent and, and follow His will the right way. God, He will not brush our sin under the rug if we do not want to give those sins up. He wants us to change. He wants us to repent. To obtain the forgiveness of our sins, we must determine to forsake all sin to repent of all sin, and to do our best to obey God's will. For the remainder of this lesson, I want us to put the plentiful grace of God that we read of in the Bible to the test in a real world full of really bad sinners. I want us to consider eight different examples together. Uh, and these eight examples that we're going to consider, we're going to look at and see whether God lived up to His promises about extending forgiveness to these individuals, or whether He was willing to. First on the list, let us consider the tax collectors and the sinners. The tax collectors and the sinners, they were acknowledged by others, and they even admitted by themselves to be notorious transgressors of God's law. They didn't deny that. And yet, when they came to Jesus, they always found grace enough and to spare. Luke 15, 1 and 2 says, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to hear him, or drew near to him to hear him, and the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Mark chapter 2, verses 15 and 16 reveals, Now it happened, as he was dining in Levi's house, that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, How is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? What we see in the, uh, the New Testament, especially in the Gospels, we see that Jesus was f uh, willing to forgive these tax collectors and these sinners if they would accept His teachings and obey Him. He was willing to do that to, with them as well as anyone. Second, consider the account of the sinful woman who anointed Jesus' feet with fragrant oil and wiped, her, uh, wiped them with her hair that we can read about in Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. And this woman who we read about, her reputation followed her. She was known to be a sinner. That's what the text, I believe the text indicates, that she was a sinner. And third, closely related, let us consider the woman who got caught in bed with someone who was not her husband in John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. Would grace cover such scandal that these women were involved in? The answer is yes. Both found that Jesus had grace enough to cover their sins so long as they forsook those sins and followed their Savior faithfully. In John chapter 8, verse 11, Jesus told the woman caught in adultery, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Fourth, what about a traitor who was of the inner circle, who forsook the Lord and denied Him three times? Did God forgive such a person? I think you know who I'm talking about. Peter was all of these things. He was a traitor. He was of the inner circle. He forsook the Lord and he denied the Lord three times and yet God was willing to forgive Peter. Matthew 26, 34 says, Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. He denied his master three times on the night that the friend of sinners most needed a friend. But on that night, Jesus didn't have a friend. He was all alone. Peter cursed and swore that he did not even know Jesus. Matthew 26, 74 records, Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. That's a very sad verse. Could God's grace cover such a high-handed offense? 
Yes, the Bible tells us that Jesus forgave Peter. But surely he was on probation, right? Certainly he was counted as second rate, right? No, less than two months later, Jesus selected him to be the keynote speaker on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. He featured him as the key character of the first half of the book of Acts. He used Peter to write or pen two inspired books, First and Second Peter. He allowed Peter and placed him as an elder in a local church later on in his life, as First Peter chapter 5, verse 1 notes. So God forgave him and allowed him to serve in a great capacity, even after making those many mistakes. Fifth, let us consider those who were guilty of crucifying the Lord Jesus Christ. It would be hard to imagine a case today that could be equal to that of the Pentecost sinners. These individuals, they were responsible for the death of the Son of God and the Creator of the universe. And even as terrible as their sins were, Peter offered them a hopeful sermon. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, he provided them with the remedy for their sins. He said, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. As Acts chapter 2, verse 41 states, many souls followed Peter's divine command. That verse says, then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. In the following weeks, many others took up God's offer uh, to be washed clean of their sins or from their sins. Acts chapter 2, verse 47 records, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Sixth, what about moral delinquents, such as those mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11? Could God forgive uh, people who engaged in such sins listed in this passage? I think you know where I'm going with that. The answer is yes. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9-11, through 11, Paul said, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And don't miss the next phrase, And such were some of you, but you were washed. But you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. See, by God's grace, those Christians to whom Paul wrote in Corinth, they had been washed, they had been sanctified, and they had been justified, even though some of them were guilty in their former life of committing the sins Paul listed there in that passage. And so that's a great passage to turn to when you're wondering, can God forgive me? He said uh, that he could forgive and that he did forgive many of those uh, Christians who were from Corinth or living in Corinth. Seventh, let us consider Simon, who we can read about in Acts chapter 8. Verse 13 of Acts chapter 8 says, Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs which were done. And so, of course, this verse proves that he had become a Christian. Or in other words, he was someone who got into a saved condition. He had given up his sinful lifestyle, as well as the sin of sorcery, which he had previously practiced. However, not very long after that, when he saw that the Holy Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, and he was asking them to, give, uh, to be given that power. And this, of course, was sinful, as you read in that account. And what we see next, or shortly after that, is Peter confronting Simon. And what did he say to him in Acts chapter 8, verse 20? He said to Simon, Your money perish with you, because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. And Peter went on, as he's rebuking Simon, to express to Simon that his heart was not right in the sight of God at that moment, in that particular uh, instance. And even though this was a bad spiritual state to be in, Simon could still be forgiven. How do I know? We know this because of what Peter said to him in Acts chapter 8, verse 22. In Acts chapter 8, verse 22, Peter said to Simon, Repent therefore of this your wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. You see, Simon was a Christian who got, a, got himself into a lost condition, but there was hope for him to be forgiven by God. If he would repent of his sins, if he would confess those sins to God, and if he would ask for God's forgiveness, God would forgive him. 
And the same remedy for sins is available today for Christians when they commit sin. In our New Testament, in the book of 1 John, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says this to Christians, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Eighth and lastly, let us consider Saul of Tarsus, who we also know as the Apostle Paul. At one time, as you read throughout your New Testament in the book of Acts, he was a major enemy of the kingdom of heaven. He once tested the grace enough and to spare principle as perhaps no other individual has. He had once been a blasphemer of God and a murderer of innocent Christians. He, uh, he had witnessed and he was partially guilty of the mob killing of the Christian martyr named Stephen, as we can read about in Acts chapter 7. Surely Saul would find that grace could cover only so much and that he had long ago crossed that line, right? Is that what the Bible says? No, he too found grace enough and to spare with God. He had his sins washed away in the obedient act of baptism as he called upon the name of the Lord. In Acts chapter 22, verse 16, Ananias asked him, And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And years later, after he became a Christian, Paul wrote of himself in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, talking about his former life. And he said, Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. It's interesting that Paul still called himself the chief of sinners. And I want you to think about this. Is it any wonder that Paul wrote about grace more than any New Testament writer? Why, why would you think Paul wrote about that? Per perhaps it was because he needed a whole lot of grace. And the same is true for us. We need a lot of grace too. Uh, for those who struggle with the guilt of past sins, the Apostle Paul is a great person to look to uh, for help in overcoming it. And one of my, uh, a verse or passage that I really like in Philippians uh, is, is the right mindset that we need to have as Christians. And Paul expressed it. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14, Paul said, Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have, apprehend, uh, to have apprehended, but one thing I do. And I, listen, listen to the next part. This is what we need to have as Christians, the mindset. He says, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. In uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 23, Paul said, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, Paul stated, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everyone who reaches the age of accountability or level of accountability will choose to sin and separate themselves from God. And the result of sinning against God is that sinners need to have those sins forgiven by God. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, Paul revealed where redemption, where access to Christ's blood, and where the forgiveness of sins are located. In that verse, he said, in Him, referring to Jesus, in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according uh, to the riches of His grace. And so the location of all these things that I just listed, the redemption, of, uh, the redemption that's through His blood, the forgiveness of our sins, and... Uh, the location of salvation, all of those things, as that verse says, are located in Christ. Well, the next question that should follow with that is, how does one get into Christ? In Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 and 27, Paul revealed how sinners get into Christ. In those verses, he said, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So back to the question of our lesson, which is, can God really forgive me? The answer to the question is yes. The question of, will God really forgive me? As I already noted, it is conditioned upon each individual person's desire to do what God commands them to do to be forgiven. You see, if we are willing to accept God's terms to obtain forgiveness from Him, 
then yes, God will forgive us. We have to take God at His word. We also need to be very consistent with the Scriptures. Brethren, if we heard someone come into this building, maybe get behind this pulpit or teach in a Bible class, um, that baptism is not required to be saved, or if they got up here and denied the essentiality of baptism, all of us would quickly object to that, or at least we should, um, because the Bible is very clear on that matter. Yet, even though we would do that sometimes, uh, I, or this is a good question, why is it the case that sometimes Christians question God on other topics that are equally as clear in the Scriptures, uh, such as, uh, as baptism, such as His willingness and His ability to forgive the penitent? Sometimes it's very easy for us to see the things that maybe we don't struggle with. Baptism is for the remission of sins. That's easy for us to accept. But sometimes when we read about how God will forgive us if we truly repent, sometimes we struggle to accept that truth. But we shouldn't. We should be consistent with the Scriptures because it's the same God delivering those messages. If the Bible teaches that baptism saves, which it does in numerous passages, then we must accept that teaching. If the Bible says that God will forgive those who do what He says to be forgiven, then we must accept those teachings or that teaching as well. We must not let Satan steal our peace away from us. All Satan did with Eve, with the temptation to eat the forbidden fruit, was that he inserted that three-letter word, not, into what God had told her. And he's still doing that today with a lot of verses. In uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 4, the devil said this to Eve, You will not surely die. But God said you will surely die. So we've got to be very careful of these lies that Satan wants us to believe. And so that is the lesson for this evening, brethren. I'll offer the invitation at this time, and I'll begin that by asking the question, are you right with God today? If Jesus came back today, would you be certain, would you be positive that you would dwell with Him eternally? If you're here today or listening to this lesson online, I want you to consider the question, have you obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ? The Bible teaches that every sinner must obey the gospel of Jesus Christ to be saved from their sins and to be added by Christ to His one church. And here's how a sinner obeys the gospel and gets saved from their sins today. The Bible says all sinners must hear the gospel, Romans 10, 17. They need to believe the gospel message that Jesus Christ is the divine Son of God who died, was buried, and rose again on the third day, thus defeating death. John 8, 24 reveals that we must believe that Jesus is who He said He is. The Bible also reveals that all sinners must repent of their sins. Luke 13, 3, they need to confess their faith in Christ before others as being the divine Son of God, Romans 10, 9, and 10. And of course, the Bible also teaches that all sinners must submit to God's command to be baptized, which means to be immersed in water for the remission or forgiveness of their sins, Acts 2, 38, Acts 22, 16. And so if you've not done so yet, if you've not followed that simple plan we read of in the New Testament, why not obey the gospel today? Why not have your sins contacted or make, why not make contact with the blood of Christ through the act of baptism and have your sins washed away? If you're in need of being assisted and being baptized into Christ or if you are a Christian who is in need of prayer or if you have a, a spiritual need, uh, please come forward and make it known as we stand and sing the invitation song.